Thank you. So we'll dive into the big void now, mm -hmm. or do you like to call it the large cavity or the big <laughs> void? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm quite funny about naming things, and, and uh, I, 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 I like to avoid naming things uh, particularly because, for example, right now we don't know for sure that there is a, uh, a big void as such, and even, even so, I would rather say what we discover will be what we discover as opposed to what somebody else has discovered. So um, I'd just rather give it a more generic uh, name, but it doesn't make any difference. We have, we have to, uh, it's good to, uh, I, th I think we should start with acknowledging the, the great work that the Scan Pyramids project has done in the pyramid. Can, uh, can you actually b b mention and, and explain how you are different than the Scan Pyramids team? Because I think there's yeah. some confusion there. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a link. There are links and there, there is confusion. So uh, going back to the old days of the Jedi uh, Pyramid robot exploration, uh, Jean-Pierre Houdin had introduced us to Dassault System. Dassault System sponsored a lot of the Jedi work. And uh, after a, f a few years, there was a reorganization at Dassault System where they decided that they weren't going to support Jedi anymore. It's just about every three years they have a shakeup of the organization. The two guys at Dassault System that we worked with directly were Richard Breitner and Mehdi Tayubi. Uh, after we'd finished with Jedi, uh, Mehdi uh, started to set up a, another organization, which became Scan Pyramids. And we were, I was invited to be part of that organization. And to a certain extent, they had got a lot of credibility because obviously Mehdi had been, or Dassault System had been associated with the good work that we'd done on Jedi in the first place. So they got a little bit of an in there. So I was invited to be part of that organization. And I said, uh, I, th I think it was that I really wanted to have more control over what was being done rather than being just a part of that uh, organization. And at the same time, we were researching things in parallel, the techniques that we would apply to the pyramid. So one thing that uh, Jean-Pierre needed for his theory was uh, thermographic images of the pyramid close up. As far as I know, I was the first person to go onto the plateau and grab these images so we could look at the temperature of the pyramid at night time, which would give you clues about internal structure. I also uh, carried out independent research of the muon tomography, which is the sort of x-rays, um, x-ray technique that they eventually used in parallel with that as well. Uh, any application that I put in was generally associated with Zai Hawass, who was out of favor at the time. And uh, the scan pyramids then went off and did their thing uh, without my involvement. And so that's how we are separate, but we are combined. It comes of effectively from the same uh, point and then a scan pyramids work uh, ramped down having done all of the non-invasive work if you like uh, using only those techniques which were uh, myography and uh, thermal imaging uh, and then uh, there's a there's there's those that's as far as they were going to go, and then, at, 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 and then I, um, and then Zahi Hawass uh, had obviously said the right things and come up with the right ideas and plans uh, for us to get back in, in involved in it. So we're completely separate now from Scan Pyramids. Uh, so, so the work that they did, just to reiterate uh, the main the main point, and this is very important is um, to give a bit of background of myography, uh, muon topography, it's like a 3D x-ray. And, and the way that it works is that uh, all of the time you have got muons passing through you. You might have thousands every minute. 
these muons, uh, they are caused by cosmic rays, and they come from all over space, interacting with our atmosphere, and they give off other particles. These particles can penetrate very far through. They can easily go through us, uh, and they can relatively easily go through stone and rock. And so by, by placing detectors on the other side of uh, stone or rock from where the cosmic rays are coming from, it's just like taking an x-ray. So you can sort of see bright spots, shadows, that sort of thing. And that's the basic technology behind it. And they use very, various different techniques. And the good thing is that two things came out of that. Uh, two objects, if you like, two interesting areas in the pyramid. They can't resolve down tiny features, uh, but they can get a good idea about relatively large spaces. One was uh, the uh, what they call the North Face Corridor, which was, it's not a surprise, is that on the side of the pyramid there's a, 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 a structure at the, effectively at the main entrance, which has got a gabled uh, entrance. It's not a surprise that there's a structure, a sort of a hollow structure beyond there. But the muon tomography showed that. And when they put a much larger endoscope than we use, when, when they put the camera through there, they saw that indeed there was a cavity there, which is validating the technique. What's more exciting is that they discovered a, a much larger void uh, somewhere above the Grand Gallery. And this doesn't seem to be just um, a, a figment of the uh, technique, although there was a, a slight chance that there were that there's, there's a way that you could produce this shadow without there, anything, without there being anything there. Uh, but it seems like that is a real cavity. And what, so, what percent chance do you think that, that it's a real cavity? I'd say... A, more than 90%. More than 9-0. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so what we, what we are, so we can have some confidence there is something left to find. Now the question is, what is that cavity? Uh, if, we, if we could guess at it now and we could say it could be anything from a, just an infill of lower density rubble. It, uh, say, for example, in a space that they used for construction of the pyramid, or it could be anywhere as exciting as, you know, a whole funerary chamber of the scale of Tutankhamun's treasure and beyond. Uh, that's the interesting thing. The challenging thing is trying to work out exactly what that looks like and how we get access to it. And that's what I've spent a lot of the last few years thinking about you know you know where it is ex almost exactly i guess well not almost exactly because yeah. you end up with a sort of a cloud it's almost like a fuzzy cloud and you'd have to do an awful lot more surveying to using uh, muon tomography to to get a anywhere near an accurate depiction and you could do that over like 20 years or something like that i guess uh, but we have other techniques that we can bring to bear on it to start to narrow down the, sh the shape and the location. And I believe it was my idea, although, you know, sometimes you get things in, 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 in your head and you think, well, I had this idea all along, but it might have been somebody else may have already suggested it. But the guy, uh, Jan Franke, who, 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 who is the GPR expert, he does a lot of his uh, he, he does a lot of his survey work with uh, with 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 GPRs, which are effectively like um, ro ropes. Uh, 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 and I decided to call them snakes because they look like snakes to me. So uh, you have uh, two uh, two say thirty seven centimeter long uh, rectangular blocks, and uh, you have a uh, you have a connecting material in, in in between, and they might be between three and six meters long. And these are radar. So one end uh, sends out a radar pulse, and the other. So it's like the head of the the snake sends out a radar pulse, and the tail of the snake receives it. And you can uh, detect anything within, well, say thirty meters away uh, from wherever you put it. The disadvantage of these is that 
uh, because they are not shielded, so they are firing out the radar in any direction, is that you get a return from any direction and you only know that there's an object within a certain distance away. You couldn't say what direction it's in. It's like sending out a cylinder of, um, of, of a, a, a sensing cil cylinder, if you like. Uh, but the advantage is these things are so narrow that we can almost use them to do uh, keyhole surgery or keyhole investigation because we have four places in the pyramid where we can access with these snakes and that's the shafts that we've been discussing. So my idea was that if we can first of all send these radars up the shafts, we know what sort of signal we should be getting depending on which shaft we put it into if that makes sense. So first of all you guess where the cavity is and then you say, okay, I'm seeing something approaching, 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 going away, going away, going away. And then that gives you a clue. And if you do that from enough positions, you can start to build up a, an estimated 3D picture. So that's the first thing that we will do is we'll send these radars up the shafts. And we have done that already. The four shafts. Up the, the four shafts, mm -hmm. yeah. Kings, Queens, North, South, North, yeah, South. Yeah, yeah. So you can imagine with that you can start to get an estimate. But we're also working on a sort of a tomographic technique where you could have one radar position, say, on the outside of the pyramid and one radar inside a shaft. Mm -hmm. And then you can start to see what's happening uh, between them. And then you use a little bit of clever maths and then you can work it out. So, but don't you, you know that it's not, you know, you, it's either on the south side or the north side. You know which, do you know which side it's on yet, north or south? Yes, we do. So it's, it's, it's definitely on the north side, but okay. we're going to look in all. We're going to look in all of them because what we don't we we can resolve a lot better. We can resolve a lot clearly. So the key shaft would be uh, shaft I in that diagram, which right. is, or you know the shaft closest to the eye, which is the um, which is the king's chamber northern right. side. And if you look just below there, the red and the green shadows, that's the possible locations of where the big void has. Uh, scan pyramids called it would be and by going up c you should be able to kind of pinpoint whether or not it's yeah horizontal or yeah. kind of 45 degrees yeah. yeah so you start to get a feel for where it is uh the uh but because we can we can identify smaller structures you might send something up d or b and and, and find something something else because there are clues, there are clues in the shafts that suggest that there might be other uh, interesting structures in there. Uh, but if we focus only on the ca on on that cavity for now, that's our immediate interest is to is is to see uh, how far away the cavity is from the shaft, and then to work that out in relation to any possible access points. So remember that our key is to do minimally invasive. It's really not to harm the pyramid in any way if we can. So we look for all sorts of cracks, gaps, uh, whatever we can use to get as close as possible to that space. And uh, so it's really a case of gathering as much information as we can to try to, to narrow it down. So a most likely scenario would be going through the shaft through like some either already existing crack within one of the within either I or C. I wouldn't say within the shaft. I know that people have sort of um, suggested that uh, that's uh, a possibility unless we find that one of the cracks is particularly helpful so that we can have like a long wire endoscope say. My my best guess at the moment is We've, um, I have to be a little bit careful because I can't really talk about unpublished results. But if you look at the, uh, if, if the King's Chamber, if you look at the uh, lower right hand side of the King's Chamber, there's a, what's called an antechamber. And uh, behind that is where uh, the Italian explorer Caviglia uh, started digging because he wanted to find out where this shaft went to. So there's already a big man-made uh, tunnel which, which, which extends into the bottom part of that northern shaft. So 
It's not in a place that is sort of has any beauty. We know it's been damaged already, and there's a possibility that radar surveys in there show that there are big voids, big cavities beyond that. So it may be that within there one can uh, uh, deploy a um, either a, 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 a very um, a, a, a sort of a flexible snake uh, and send it up towards where the uh, cavity is or uh, it may be that uh, we can drill something as small as 15 millimeters diameter which is really not big in the scheme of things inside the pyramid half an inch uh, or so and and within that we can insert a uh, a, a micro robot which is um one of the things that you've been helping with <laughs> and the the idea with this micro robot is that it's pencil shaped but when it gets beyond the through the inside of the drill diameter when it gets out the other side legs pop out so it's got what you call wegs, which are a combination of wheels and legs, which means that it's got a lot of uh, manoeuvrability, so it could go several metres into any uh, cavity that we find. So I'm just talking about gen in general terms here. Obviously, whatever we do would be dependent upon what we find. Uh, but I suppose what I'm saying is I'm speculating about what technique we can use depending on what we find and what the authorities uh, allow us to do. All we can say is, we feel that this is the gentlest, the best way to discover things inside the pyramid. This is our professional approach, but it's not up to us uh, what is what, what is allowed. We just we can only advise uh, and then be ready to do something when we're allowed to. Okay, so it, it, the the general shape and size of the void. I've heard that it's estimated to be about the size of two semi trucks, and so with it just being shadows and with it just being kind of estimates based on this muon uh, technology mm -hmm. how close to accurate is that do we do we know i i, I think we can be more than 50, i think we would say that it's more than 50 percent likely that we would be looking at something which would be say 40 meters long by four by four meters so Okay. It would be equivalent, effectively, of finding a grand gallery above the grand gallery. Right. And if anybody, for anybody who's been in the pyramid, you will realise what an impressive space, the what an impressive volume the grand gallery is. Because as you ascend into the pyramid, I think if you one is claustrophobic, you think, well, this is a little bit um, tight. But then when it opens up into the grand gallery, it's almost like entering into a cathedral. Um, and it's that sort of impressive volume. Uh, so imagine what if there is another, even if it's just another grand gallery for whatever reason, again, it would be give a clue about the purpose of the galleries. Uh, but that's the sort of scale that we're looking at, and we can be fairly confident about that. And then the question is, would you find a similar space as the grand gallery, or would it be split up into uh, smaller um, spaces? It's unusual to have a long sort of relatively narrow, relatively low height thing. Grand Gallery is one thing. Um, one large tunnel wouldn't make, a, uh, wouldn't make a lot of sense, just a single large tunnel, so it may be split up into rooms. If it's split up into rooms, that makes it even more interesting because then you say, if it's split up into rooms, you are into the realms of not just um, construction um, chambers or, you know, construction routes, but rooms that were planned to be in there uh, and that makes it very exciting to consider you know if there were rooms that were planned to be in there what what might they be and I, 